Hey guys, so today I decided to do another concept car video, so this is going to be part 4 for Dodge concept cars. These are cars that Dodge designed, produced, and even showed off at auto shows, but then they cancelled them and we never actually got to buy them or drive them. So today's video is going to look at 4 really cool concept cars from Dodge that never made it to the factory for whatever reason, and we can see what could have been if these cars were on the roads or in our driveways. Make sure to check the links in the description for parts 1 to 3 if you do want to check those out. In those videos we've already covered 13 other stunning concepts from Dodge like the Copperhead, Sidewinder, M80, Super 8 Hemi, and ZEO. Today we're going to look at 4 more. The Dodge Aviat, Ram T-Rex, Dodge Hornet, and Dodge EV. I'll talk about these in chronological order and I've tried to find as much detail as possible while fitting all 4 into one video. So the first concept I want to cover today is an interesting one, but one that there wasn't too much information on. That would be the 1994 Dodge Aviat, showed at the 1994 Detroit Auto Show. This was a strange two-door sports coupe with many bizarre features. The body was computer generated and the front end looks very meek and almost childish, with a tiny grille, small headlights, and little mirrors that stick out. The sides have a massive air scoop that sweeps right through the back end, and there's a full fender skirt that fully covers up the rear wheels. They also decided to add scissor doors for some reason. The body was built with the aim to have a low drag coefficient to improve aerodynamics and performance. The engine was a double overhead cam, 2 liter 4 cylinder, the same one that was found in the Dodge Neon, and for this application it made 145 horsepower. The engine was in the front, but interestingly the cooling system was put in the rear fenders. And the only other information I found was that this car was built to be extremely lightweight, but there wasn't anything else published on the car that I could find. This was a unique looking concept, but more of a one-off experiment. The side air scoop was very odd, and that made the rear end look very old school and boxy, and I definitely don't like the covered rear wheels on a modern vehicle. In 1995, the Dodge Concept team was given 14 months to cook something up, and over that time frame, if you were lucky enough, you could see a Chrysler 6x6 being performance tested at the Chelsea, Michigan Proving Grounds facility. And by 1997, we had the Dodge Ram T-Rex, which could mean the presence of a dinosaur, but also doubles by standing for Technology Research Experimental Vehicle. This was a 6x6 full-size Dodge Ram that was a total monster. Leon Dong, who was the manager of Advanced Chassis and Drivetrain for Dodge, said, quote, We wanted to make something no one could turn away from, but we also wanted to make something exist in the real world, something that could eventually get made. End quote. This was Chrysler's first attempt at a 6x6 sport truck, and they built it on a 133-inch regular cab 1-ton chassis, which would have been the Ram 3500 4x4 frame. The front half is the exact same as the regular Ram at the time, but the back half was fully boxed and dead straight in order to accommodate the dual rear wheels. We also don't know what the T-Rex cost Chrysler to make, but it wasn't too substantial and they did pull a lot of parts off the shelf for it. From the beginning the designers wanted to create the 6x6 with tandem drive axles to create a traction monster and have maximum off pavement capability. As mentioned they used a lot of off the shelf parts to save money. So there was an NVG242 full-time transfer case from a Hummer. The four-wheel drive system was taken from the Jeep Grand Cherokee and Dodge Durango. And the transfer cases mated to off-the-shelf heavy-duty truck axles. After some modifications, the end result for the transfer case was called NVG244 HD, which offered both a four-wheel and six-wheel drive option, all controlled from your dashboard. The four-wheel drive full-time is basically similar to a rear-wheel drive system, but instead of just two wheels turning, you've got four at the rear. The six-wheel drive full-time has a center differential and all axles open, and there's also other options like six-wheel drive full-time locked and a 6LO option. In six-wheel drive, 48% of the engine torque was sent to the front axle and the remaining 52% to the rear. The six-wheel drive tandem axle is paired with a computer-controlled adaptive air suspension system with Firestone-designed air springs and air suspension airbags at each wheel. There were many sensors continuously monitoring the whole system, so that meant that you could adjust the suspension in several different ways. The shocks could be adjusted in comfort or sport, and you could adjust the ride height with the airbags up or down 6 inches, with different options of max off-road, off-road, auto-adjust, entry, and disable, which each would rise or deflate the bags to a certain level. As for the power plant, a high output 8 liter Magnum V10 was thrown in here with a whopping 497 horsepower and 593 pound feet of torque. 
This engine was heavily modified with high compression pistons, billet crank, ported and polished heads, modified camshaft, bigger injectors, forged steel rods, and tubular headers. This was paired with a beefed up 4 speed automatic that was taken from the Ram. And if you're wondering about performance, this 12,000 pound vehicle can go 0 to 60 in just 7.7 .7 seconds and run a quarter mile in 16.1 seconds. As for some other numbers, the max lateral g force was 0 0.74, payload was 5,000 pounds, and the towing capacity was a whopping 26,000 pounds. The truck came with 17 by 8 inch aluminum wheels with 285, 65, 17 tires, and the bed was 8 feet 6 inches long. And one last fun fact. The T-Rex was an unlockable vehicle in the 2001 video game called Test Drive Off-Road Wide Open. So this was definitely a monster, but that much compression probably would have not been very practical, and I'm sure the repairs on that suspension system would have been extremely costly over time. I'm also not sure how the gas mileage would have passed emissions testing at the time. Years later, we do have the Mercedes-Benz G63 AMG 6x6, if you really need to satisfy your 6x6 cravings, but that does have a much higher price tag than the T-Rex would have ever had. 2006 was a big year for Dodge, where they dropped the Challenger concept, Charger Super B, Caliber, Nitro, Caliber SRT4, and the Rampage concept. Last but not least, there was the 2006 Dodge Hornet concept, unveiled at the 2006 Geneva Motor Show. This was a mini multi-purpose vehicle, or subcompact, with front-wheel drive. Looking at this immediately made me think of a Nissan Cube, and Dodge spokespeople said that this would be the Chrysler variant to vehicles like that Cube. Chrysler actually had wanted to expand into Europe and compete with cars such as the Toyota Yaris and Chevrolet Avio in the B segment, and Chrysler had already released the Aquino concept. So the Hornet was Dodge's first attempt at making a car this small, and they thought that this Cube-like design would appeal to younger buyers across the world, and especially in Europe. The Hornet name was taken from the previous AMC Hornet, as rights to the name had passed down to Chrysler when they acquired AMC in 1987, and it did work with other B-type products that Dodge had, like the Charger and Ram Super B. The starting price was very low, around $10,000 per car, but Dodge wanted to try and find a partner to team up with on this car to maximize economies of scale since they weren't making very much profit at that price. To me, the Hornet had a very chunky design with the fender flares, and interestingly had a visible intercooler and fully functional hood scoop. Dodge did try to add a bit of sporty look here to appeal to the youth, and the concept showed off some interesting features like gold brake calipers, a rear diffuser, 19-inch wheels, a panoramic sunroof tinted in blue view, and the car is painted in beryllium grey, topped off with light grey viper stripes. The doors are also rear hinged, so they open to show that there is no B-pillar to be found. As for the inside, the goal is to maximize interior space and accommodate both left-hand and right-hand drive depending on the different markets where it was being sold, but it sure did look a bit strange according to the press photos. The center stack looked fairly basic, but it did have a navigation screen that poked out from the top. The instrument cluster would move as you adjust the steering wheel, and for some reason there was a built-in first aid kit in the driver's side storage, along with a pull-down storage bin. The driver's side door also had a cool feature where you could cool your drink, and the passenger side door had a pull-out table, maybe for eating when stopped on a road trip or something like that. The thin seats were made of foam, with built-in seatbelt and aluminum framing, and the rear seats and passenger seat folded away into the ground for more space. With everything folded down, you can actually see that the durable floor is made with honeycomb texture rubber to prevent scratching and damages. And finally, instead of hooks to grab onto in the back, you got full metal bars instead. So as for the powertrain, as mentioned, this was front-wheel drive, and the engine in the front there was a 1.6-liter four-cylinder supercharged Tri-Tech engine that pumped out 170 horsepower and 165 pound-feet of torque. This came with a six-speed manual, again to appeal to that European audience, and the same engine was also found in the Mini Cooper S models, as it had been developed by Range Rover and Chrysler in a joint project. I was surprised at how heavy the Hornet was, sitting at 3,100 pounds, but Dodge claimed that it could do 0 to 60, tested at a time between 6.7 to 7.5 seconds, and it had a top speed of 130 miles per hour. The Hornet was fully expected for production by 2010, but it got dropped during the 2009 financial crisis. Once Chrysler merged with Fiat, the Hornet was then seen for testing in 2011, and the automotive world expected a 2013 Hornet model release that might share a Mercedes A-Class platform but the Hornet eventually gave way to the Dart, and that was that. 
I think that the Hornet was very functional and had decent performance too, mixing American and European desires into one car. I'm really not a fan of the cube-like design though, and I'm not sure it would have done better than the Dart, but it probably would have sold well for just $10,000. In the late 2000s, Chrysler's in-house ENVI, Hybrid and Electric Vehicle Engineering Center, began focusing on possible electric vehicles like the Jeep EV, Chrysler Town & Country Minivan EV, and even the Dodge ZDO, which I covered in another concept video. There was also the Dodge EV, or Dodge Electric Vehicle, which was a rear-wheel drive coupe with absolutely zero tailpipe emissions, so this meant that it was an all-electric sports car. The world was introduced to the sports car at the 2009 North American International Auto Show, and Lotus partnered up for the design of this concept, providing the platform which is from the Lotus Europa. The result is a beautiful coupe, painted in yellow with dual black stripes across the entire body. The EV system consists of an electric motor, lithium-ion battery pack, and an integrated power controller. Dodge claims that this car could get a range of 150 to 200 miles per charge, and could fully charge in 8 hours with a regular 110 volt outlet, and in just 4 hours with a 220 volt outlet. Power was respectable as this EV had 268 horsepower and 480 pound-feet of torque coming from the electric motor, but of course there was no roar of the engine. As for performance, Chrysler said 0-60 to 60 happens in under 5 seconds, quarter mile in 13 seconds, and the top speed of over 120 miles per hour. Chrysler saw the Tesla Roadster as a major competitor for the EV and tried to match them in battery range and power. They did so with the battery range, but the Tesla had a 0-60 time of closer to 4 seconds, not 5. Lotus also built some of the Roadsters for Tesla, so if Chrysler could have struck a deal with them as well, this car could have been a real possibility at an affordable cost. This was supposed to be a sure thing, and Chrysler CEO Bob Nardelli had promised that we would see one of the three electric vehicles shown on screen by 2010 in the US and 2011 in Europe. But unfortunately, by May 2009, the Dodge EV had been cancelled, and later that year in November, the Chrysler Electric Car Division was totally dropped. I think this is another example of Chrysler's reluctance to tap into the electric vehicle market, and the Dodge EV would have been a great performance sports car that had some really good range at the time, and also very solid power numbers. They also had the 2008 ZEO concept, but that was cancelled as well. I do wonder what would have happened if Chrysler had released some of these electric vehicles before the rest of the world, gaining a first mover advantage. 10 years later, we still don't have an electric car from Chrysler. Well, that's the end of the video, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed seeing these concept cars. I definitely think it's fun to see the ideas that Chrysler comes up with. Let me know which one was your favorite out of the Aviat, T-Rex, Hornet, and EV. And which concept car video should I do next? Make sure to subscribe for more Mopar and car content, and I'll see you next video.